Oh, okay. <laughs> well, Bob was going to sing with him. It was going to be Chuck and Bob. Well, why y'all ready? Are y'all ready? Why y'all ready? Are you ready? Well, I tell you what's going to happen tonight. <clears throat> when the preacher gets up here in just a few minutes, it's going to be exciting. He's got some good stuff to tell you. But in the meantime, let's sing a song or two. 167. Do that one first, and then 173. Yeah, you're supposed to have your guitar on. 167, y'all stand up if you would and sing with me. <clears throat> Some of you did, some of you didn't. I like it. 173.
Chuck, if you would open us up in prayer tonight, please. Amen. You may be seated. Good evening. Even in the water and the rain. Do some of you guys are like the postman. Rain, slow, snow, or sleep won't keep me from where I'm supposed to be going. I like that. Amen. It's good to have you back in God's house. I hope you've had a good afternoon and a good day and looking forward to an exciting night. Looking forward to the Word of God having its way in our lives. And ask you to continue to pray. Pray for Israel peace of Israel, pray for the repentance of America, that we'll get back to where we need to be with God, and uh, tonight we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the possibilities that uh, some of you, how many have read the book, The Harbinger? Okay, a couple, several of you, parts of it. Uh, It's written in a a narrative form, so I don't really like those kind of books that have to do with uh, biblical truth written in a narrative form. That doesn't mean they don't have some, uh, a lot of value in them, but I that's just me, uh, and, and I'm, most preachers I know don't like to read narratives. <laughs> they like to read Scripture and Scriptures that have to do it. But uh, I'm not preaching the book, that book. I'm preaching the book because that's where he draws his truth from, and we'll be sharing with you tonight. By the way, if you would like to have the, the Harbinger, I think we can get it online for about $9, uh, the paperback. And if any of you would like to have it, I'll be more than happy to order it for you. I'm I'm not suggesting that you order it necessarily. You don't necessarily need it. We'll give you, uh, unless you just want to read it and get a hold of it. Um, It has has its value, or I wouldn't have read it. Someone suggested I read it. And, of course, I I did read it, and I found it to be, I believe, a wake-up call to the church in America especially. Uh, and hopefully it will, it will help us to comprehend where we really are. It's difficult sometimes because things happen so rapidly today. Um, in the last, I want to say the last 20, 25 years, I have seen more Bible prophecy fulfilled where you can validate it than in the last, I don't know, from what I can read from the last several hundred years. So it's all coming to pass, and it's happening rapidly. I believe that's what John meant when he said that, uh, you know, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And I believe that when, when these things start unfolding, it's going to happen rapidly. I don't believe John says, come right now, although I know he meant that, and that's one of the things he meant. And his desire was he was on the Isle of Patmos, but normally when you find it in the book of Revelation about the things that must shortly come to pass, it has to do with once they start, they'll happen immediately. So that's why I'm thinking we are today. And my, my primary ministry to this church is to do just that, is to do my best to continue to prepare the church for the receiving of Jesus Christ when he comes. And also to reach, prepare the church to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ while there's still time. 
So hopefully we'll, uh, this will give us a little bit more insight of what's going on. And I'm not going to be doing a lot of study into the book itself. And for the first couple of lessons, is going to be introductions to help you gather uh, some idea of what we're talking about. But if you choose and you would like to have the book, I'm going to be making an order probably tomorrow. So if you would like to have the book, let me know. We'll be glad to get it for you. And for $9, I, I, it's worth it. The read is worth it if you choose to read it. But if you're just going to buy it to have the book, don't buy it. If you're not going to read it, don't do it. But you can also get an e-book on it. And I think you got that's what you read, wasn't it, Brother Bob? Yes. Oh, yeah. It has... It has all the ingredients. It's just written from a different form. It reminds me of the Left Behind series to some extent. And that's why the book is called A Fictional Book with Truth in It. It's written from a, from a, a narrative point, so it carries a narrative. But, but, and when I say fictional, don't, it, it's, like, it's almost like a parable or a template that I think we can see used. And uh, so I, I've enjoyed the read, and re I've read it two or three times now, and, and I think that it would be valuable to you. That's why I care to, uh, to share part of this with you, and we'll begin tonight. Also, I want you to pray. We're thinking very seriously about making some um, changes as far as our schedule, our service schedule, our, service, our schedule of services uh, here at the church. Uh, we've done a lot of praying about it. For the last two years, I've been troubled about some of the ways that we can maybe change some of the things as far as our schedule is concerned. And now since we have uh, the Bible Institute now, we're thinking seriously about changing the Bible Institute to Sunday night and running uh, two hours Sunday night and not having the regular Sunday night service. So therefore, we'd be able to, you wouldn't be, I, I believe we can overchurch people. Does that make sense? And I want to give you the most I can give you while we've got you. And so pray about that along with us. There hasn't been any definite decisions. I still need to talk to the rest of the uh, rest of the elders. I've talked to most of them, and, and, but I don't want to do anything. The elders and the pastor don't do things like this without informing you and giving you input if you choose to do so. So uh, pray about it and see how it fits in your, in your ballpark. And actually, there are some advantages, and I, I don't know if I have it. I have, I may have trouble with it because for the last 42 years, <laughs> that's just the way I've always done it. But that's not a good reason to continue to do something. Somebody say amen and help me out here. <laughs> I don't believe, and I've really had a battle with it. My wife and I have discussed this, and, and I know what Hebrews 10.25 says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I realize that, and I do believe that there can be dual applications there, but I'm also, we are adding to it. We're actually adding an hour already to the services that we did have. And so I, I just I want to think about what's best. What can we get the most out of for the time we're investing? Does that make sense? So pray about it with me, and we'll make a final announcement um, sometime within the next uh, couple of weeks and make sure that everybody knows if there's any changes. Okay. Anybody have any questions about what I just said? If you do, it's a good time to ask, and if it's not, you, Brother Jerry? Yes, yes, yes. Two advantages. Number one, it would leave a night. It would take one night off of the schedule that people are in the drive that they're having to make to come in. The other thing it would do, um, it would lessen our length of, as far as lateness because we would be getting out of here at 8 o'clock uh, on Sunday night instead of 9 o'clock on Thursday night. So I'm trying to, I, it doesn't bother me, but I, yes, it would be 6 to 8 rather than, seven to nine so just trying to think of what's best yes ma'am works for me and i think it would be uh, an, uh i would be it would just an opportunity and i feel like we ought to do it. someone has had asked me a valid question they said well suppose that uh you know suppose what if we're going to happen when we're on break during uh on um the when the Bible Institute goes, we usually take a, a month break in between terms. Well, you just have a month off. I'm sure that won't make anybody mad. 
If y'all really get, if it really bothers you, I'll come and preach on it. All right, how's that? All right. Okay. Think about it, pray about it, and let's see how it works. Okay. If it does, if it works, fine. If it doesn't work, you know, it's it's okay. I, I don't. I'm. I don't. I can't say that that God told me to do. I can't say that. I can just say, you know, this is the way I feel, and we'll see how it goes. All right. Okay, guys, come and let's receive the offering, and we'll get right on into the rest of the service, please. <clears throat> Somebody lost something. Yeah, that's all right. Well, don't forget it because it's got in God we trust on it. The only problem with that, it doesn't say what God. Well, it's according to what perspective you're talking from. <laughs> Pray for us. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jan. By the way, if anyone looks for the book, it, that's what it looks like. So you can find it at the Christian bookstore if you want to pay the price. And if not, of course, most, most retail stores are going to be more expensive than, than I would order them from usually Christian books, Christian book discount. So... Let me know if you really care to, to have one. I want you to take your Bibles and go with me tonight. And we're going to read a, some scripture before we get into involved in, into this. But we're going to look, go to Jeremiah chapter 33, first of all. And let's read the first three verses of Jeremiah 33. They'll probably be on the screen, but if you have your Bible, I encourage you to use your Bible. And the reason I do that is simply... Um, if you have your Bible, it's amazing what God will show you that I don't tell you when you're at, at beyond where I stop or before I start. So um, in Jeremiah 33, of course, God is speaking to Israel and about Israel, and he's talking about how that the prosperity of, of Israel will return based on the repentance that has happened prior to that. So read with me Jeremiah 33, verses 1 through 3. Moreover, the word of the Lord came into Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me. God said that, and I believe we have a dual application here. He says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I, I believe that the scripture is very plain, is that God implores and desires to hear his people's voice calling out to him, calling out for in praise and worship, and also many times and repentance, something that we don't hear a lot about today. It's almost a lost, lost doctrine because we've cheapened grace so much and that we see it as, as a license to sin without any repercussions. 
And that is not at all what grace was intended to be. But here we have a promise. Israel has a promise. It says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. It's important to keep that verse in mind, because when we get to Isaiah 9 and 10, we'll go there momentarily. I, I want to show you the problem that had happened to Israel and the problem that's happened, happened and is happening to America. But let's go to Isaiah 55, and let's read that first, okay? Isaiah 55, and let's read beginning in verse 6. God is offering mercy. I'm glad we have a God of mercy, aren't you? I mentioned that so much this morning. that, And uh, I, I don't think anyone is as appreciative of mercy or any more appreciative of mercy than I am. Um, if there's any been anybody, and I'm sure many of you feel the same way, that feel like we certainly don't deserve grace. You know, I, I believe every believer probably has that kind of feeling at one time or another. God, I, I don't deserve grace, and I, I don't deserve mercy, and I sure don't deserve grace. But we have a God that has the ability to issue mercy in the face of grace so that grace can do the work that nothing else can do. Humanity can't do this. Only God can do it, and we the recipients of it. So let's read. God's talking about his deep love for Israel, and he's offering mercy for her. Beginning in, let's read from verse 6 and down through verse 11. And Isaiah reminds Israel, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. And mainly this is written to the northern kingdom, of course, to Israel. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. That's a promise. That's a promise. But there's no other way. And to our God, for he will abundantly do what? Pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. One of my favorite sayings, and I'm sure many others. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth, excuse me, so so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Isaiah is reminding Israel, and you and I, that we have a God that we can't totally comprehend without his revelation. We have a God that stands higher than we are. We have a God that thinks different than we do in the sense of, until we begin to have the mind of Christ. And what he's telling the northern kingdom of Israel is this. Is you've been trying to do it your way. That won't work. The love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God will only work if it's done according to the will of God. And so he's reminding Israel of that. The last verses I want to read before I get into uh, the, the lesson tonight is found in Isaiah 9. Verses 8 through 14. This will be the primary verses that will be used throughout the book of the, of the harbinger. By the way, the term harbinger simply means sign. It's, uh, in fact, if the book itself, in my opinion, were labeled correctly, it would be the harbingers. Because there's going to be nine signs that he speaks of that, that God allowed Israel to see before the destruction of the northern kingdom. So when you, when you see the word harbinger, you realize he's talking about a sign, something that God's giving uh, Israel to understand where they are in their, in their relationship to God. But reading in uh, verse chapter 9, you do realize chapter 9 actually begins talking about the Prince of Peace, talks about the return of Christ, talks about Christ being who he is, talks about in verse 6, for unto us a child is born, the Christmas story is there. But then he talked, amazing, almost like switching gears. So he's promised Israel a Messiah. And then here's what, Israel, here's what he's told. He's told in verse 8, he, God begins to change the tune or the tone of his message. And he speaks of God's anger. You know, there's a thin line between God's love and God's anger. In order for God 
to be a God of love, he must absolutely condemn and destroy evil. Because evil is the exact opposite of pure love. So he must be a God of justice. And no matter what people think, and you'll have people tell you, well, if, well, if God's such a God of great love, why is this happening? Because he's God and you'll never understand his work. I'll never, his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And the day that we think that we're in a position to question God, I would suggest that you go take a look in the mirror and find out who's God. Think about that as verse 8 comes into play. The Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, underline that in your Bible. This is the condition, this is the attitude of Israel at this moment. And here's what they're saying. The bricks are falling down. We've had a calamity. We've had, we've had uh, the, the analogy is, we've had the bricks that have been literally, by God, brought to the ground. Look at their attitude. But we will build with huge stones, stronger material. But we'll go from bricks to we'll do this, and we're, we are... We're able to do this. We don't need any help. We, we are self-sufficient. We will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but that's all right. We will change them into cedars. Therefore, the Lord shall set up the, the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together. God says, I'm going to bring all of these together for one purpose. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts. He says, I've, I've given you a sign, I've given you a harbinger. The bricks are torn down. The sycamore trees are down. And rather than you looking at what I've allowed to happen, you've chose to say, oh, we'll take care of it. We'll overcome. We'll never quit. We'll, we'll build back. We'll, we'll build stronger. We'll, we'll do better than that which is done. Verse 14 pretty well cuts dry. He says, therefore, the Lord will cut off from Israel's head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. God says, I've warned you. I've warned you. Your response is, not repentance, arrogance, pride. We'll rebuild. We'll build the sycamore trees, change them to cedar trees, which are stronger by nature. We'll go to a stronger material stone. It's amazing. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you already begin to see a correlation between what I've just said and some of the things that are going on in America at the time. I, this author asked the question that wrote the Harbinger. He said, is it possible there exists an ancient mystery that holds the secret of America's future? It's a question. Does? Is it possible that there exists that? The Harbinger, the book he's writing, is the revealing of a mystery so precise Here's the thing that caught my attention and caused me to read the book. It is so precise that it contains the words of American leaders before they utter them, shows their actions before they take them, and pinpoints the exact dates even unto the hours of the greatest collapse in Wall Street history. Isn't that amazing? That Why would it amaze us that God knew it was going to happen before it did and even told us through another application, through a, an application to Israel. So again, and we'll talk just a minute about what the harbinger is and what it is not before we get into it. The mystery of the harbinger actually begins over 2,700 years ago. Think about that. 2,700 years ago, the, this mystery is beginning to be laid out for us. In the days of ancient Israel, in the last days of that kingdom before its judgment, there manifested nine harbingers or nine signs 
that God would allow Israel to see before total destruction. And it says, but the people of Israel disregarded the signs and continued on a path of defiance against God. What was left, of course, a number of years were given them to repent. They didn't. If I remember correctly, it's been about 14 years now, almost, since God gave America an opportunity to repent, and we didn't. We're still in defiance and arrogance as we've ever been. In fact, more so. They refused to turn back, and in 722 B.C., they were destroyed. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed because they refused to repent. Here's what's so stunning to me and eerie and, well, just a downright scary in some sense when I was reading it. The nine harbinger of judgment that appeared in Israel's last day are now reappearing on American soil. Happening. And the church has stuck her head in the sand and decided, well, we've been so blessed of God. God's not going to let anything happen to America. I'd, wait a minute. I mean, how, where have you been for the last 10 years? Just 10 quick years. Let me tell you what the harbinger is not. I think this will help us comprehend and understand a little bit before we get into the book. All of these are introductory statements, and when we get into the book itself, we'll find more about it. It does not say that Isaiah was prophesying of America. Not at all. That would be inconsistent with biblical exegesis at all. It does not say that it's prophesying are of America or that the harbingers are fulfillments of the Scripture, but rather that the biblical pattern of judgment revealed in Isaiah is now replaying in America. Simple as that. It does not say that God made a covenant with America. There are those who believe in replacement theology, and he makes it plain. He does not, and this is no attempt to, in fact, he's totally the opposite. I check this man doctrinally. He's absolutely straight in most 90% of what I check. And if I'm straight, let's put it that way. Uh, that would be questionable to some people. It does not say in any way, or it does not in any way, affect the interpretation or the hermeneutics of Isaiah 9 as speaking of Israel. I've already made that statement plain. He was speaking directly to Israel. It does not advocate replacement theology. Now, you may not know what that is, but it's simply there are those who believe that Israel will replace the church or the church will replace Israel and neither one of them are correct. The church is an extension of Israel. Israel will be, by the way, Israel's only been set aside. Israel will be grafted back in as the church is grafted in now at this point. So it does not advocate replacement theology. The teaching that God is finished with Israel and the author firmly, this author firmly advocates the opposite, that God's promise to Israel is yet to be fulfilled. So do I. It does not say that God was on the side of America's enemies any more than he was on the side of Israel's enemies. He was against them, but he chose to use them to attempt to get the people's attention. He does not, and this book does not advocate dominion theology. That simply means, or I'll read it from his words, the teaching that believers are to have dominion over the world in this age. That's heresy. God is still in control. God's got He's a whole lot smarter than we are. He's not going to give us that kind of authority. We would make idiots of ourselves. We do pretty well as it is. It does not and is not, in its essence, fiction. I said that earlier. It is written in a narrative in such a fashion that the narrative itself is fictional. People mentioned in the narrative, but the truths that are set aside are absolutely truth. The essence of the harbinger is the communication of truth, facts, biblical patterns, connections, mysteries, and what is happening in reality. These things are framed around and communicated in a narrative. Thus, the fictional story is a vessel to deliver a truth. It is a parable. That's exactly what Jesus used so much in the Scriptures. A story that wasn't a true story. It was a parable. It could be called fictional in that sense, but it was portraying a scriptural truth. But this is what a, the harbinger is, to give you just a little bit of leeway. The foundation of the harbinger, which is very simple and centered around scriptural perimeters, is this. God is righteous and judges nations. Not one nation, nations. 
God is merciful and warns of the judgment before it happens. You know, God doesn't have any obligation to do that, do that, does he? He's already told us that sin has a cost. God acts in a way that is consistent with his nature and his workings as revealed in Scripture. Thus, the pattern, the template, and progression of natural judgment or national judgment in ancient times may again be replayed. And it has through history. Daniel spoke much of that which was to come. It had to do with judgment. It had to do with restoration. God is able to warn a nation of judgment by using the scriptures, that which we have now. The Bible reveals that God's actions concerning Israel as recorded in the Hebrew scriptures were written for our instructions. You really know the book of Hebrews tells us that all that was written to Israel was written for our instructions, for our encouragement, for our for our, our understanding of how God works. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In God's dealing with ancient Israel, we find templates, blueprints, and patterns of judgment. Why should a biblical template of judgment that manifests in ancient Israel be manifesting itself again in the 21st century in America? You do know, and God, this, the author is, Israel is Israel and America is America. They're two totally different entities. So he's not trying to merge the two. Uh, neither one replaces the other. One can certainly go on endlessly listing the differences between the two nations. So why would the judgment pattern or the warning signs to Israel have anything to do with what's going on in America? Why does it have to be America? It doesn't. This author is not saying that it had to be America. It could be any nation with this one thing. First of all, God is consistent in acting consistent as it was at word, with his word. These signs are signs of national judgment. These signs of God judging a nation, not just a person. Well, it doesn't have to be America, but there's a, there's a rationale for why it takes place here. What nation would be most likely to be able to discern and understand or hear such a warning as I've just read? What other nation in the world would there be have a need for this kind of biblical principle now to begin to portray itself? A nation that rests on Judo, Christian, or biblical foundation is the only nation that would have any reason to respond to these warnings. God allowed ancient Israel to be shaken. Not for the purpose of destruction. The beginning was not to destroy Israel. The beginning was to cause Israel to repent and be restored. God doesn't have any delight in destroying nations or his people. That's not his design. He was attempting to wake up the nation, to call her back to himself, to avoid destruction. Israel refused to wake up or to turn back. She was destroyed. America is now witnessing the same pattern of judgment. The same signs, the same progression. Will America turn back? Will they be judgment or redemption? That's the author asking this. For the last nine years, I guess, or longer, before 9-11-2001, we were preaching here the preparation for the return of Christ. We were attempting to tell the church we're not ready for what's coming before the return of Christ. And I'm convinced that we're standing on the very preface of a time when decisions that we make now as Christians in this nation is going to be reflective in whatever's left of the history of this country. As it has been. We are now paying the price for what forerunners have done or, or refused to do in our country now. So to sit in the church and play church is not the answer to what's left of the time we have. Would you not agree? Somebody say amen. So understanding that, I, I was looking at some things and made some notes that, you know, what positive or redemptive purposes can, can come about through the calamity that God brings sometimes? I was just thinking about, can you think of some specific things that you remember about America in her past 
If you remember the things, I'm going to, I listed some below and listed also some other ones wrote. And think about these. Can you remember the time there was prayer in our schools in America? Can you remember the times when sermons on television and sermonettes close, closed virtually every station and broadcast day on your televisions? Can you remember when people prayed, usually when the station opened in the morning and closed at night? Now they don't close. There was, I remember first watching TV. I remember that that was a part of this closing segment when the TV station was getting ready to go off the air. It would close with prayer. Can you remember that there were Christian songs and Christmas songs or plays in schools and Christians and Easter recesses? Now they're considered holiday. Business and commerce actually closed down on Sunday because it was the Lord's Day. Wow. I can hear some of you say, well, what would we do on Sunday? I can tell you what we did on Sunday. We stayed at home and went to church. And actually, my mother even cooked dinner. I called it dinner. Y'all call it lunch. Can you remember when the name of Jesus was spoken in public gatherings? Now it's almost like a curse word. The only time you hear his name now is usually in a, in a very detrimental way. Can you remember that any time that a, a man and woman were living together without marriage, it wouldn't happen if they were on television? The TV never showed, ever, I, I don't remember showing for years, a couple living together unless they were husband, Mr. and Mrs. We've come a long way, America. Can you remember when pornography was something related to seedy places not easily accessible? The day you have to do everything you can do to keep it off of your computer that you use for the Lord. Can you remember when living together was considered a sin? By the way, God still considers it a sin. Can you remember the killing of the, when the killing of the unborn was universally seen as immoral and a sin? Wow. Can you remember when divorce was uncommon, especially among Christians? Almost unheard of. Can you remember the idea that marriage could redef be redefined as it is today? As it will be legal in our state Tuesday of this week, it will be legal for you to go to the courthouse and with another person of the same sex and get a marriage to get licensed. We have just legalized sin against God, among many other things. By the way, that's why I chose to remove my name from marriage counseling in our, in our city. Can you remember the idea that images of God and Jesus could be used in comedy and mockery were unthinkable. Would be considered blasphemous. Can you remember when this great nation, America, that I'm convinced God raised up to send the gospel to every part of the world, and we've done that to some extent. Thank God for the, for the churches that still believe in sending the word. But I need to tell you something tonight, folks. America needs missionaries worse than any country in the world. We're in more trouble than most countries. It's America was the number one credit or the creditor nation in the world. Everybody had to borrow money from us. And there was little thought of a day when its global preeminence would come to an end. How much are we in debt now? Well, you don't know the numbers because from the time I mentioned it to now, it's changed. None of us know that. This is why I think it's important. I believe Isaiah 9, 10, in fact, we'll talk about this. We'll talk about it a little bit more. But it's written to and about Israel. Not a doubt. But I believe if you take the template and lay it on America, you, it's impossible not to see it. And that's what we're looking at. We're looking at what do we do? 
And what it, first of all, God has always done this. God has always spoken to a nation from the Bible. Through his prophets before the Bible. But today through his word, he's always spoken to us. And we have a choice to either respond or not. In whatever way God calls us back. I'm convinced that on 9-11, God was sending America a warning. For about 30 days, you couldn't hardly get in a church. I remember here, we had to put chairs out. Lasted about 30 days. And then it was gone. You see, when a nation doesn't repent, and there was no repentance, we will rebuild. Do you remember that? You remember the statements our politician made? They came right out of, in fact, one of them quoted exactly from Isaiah 9-10. So the things that we're attempting to show you, and we will show you by the grace of God, as we move through these nine harbingers, you'll begin to take, a, just to get a, an idea that there's at least the possibility, in fact, I don't know how you can doubt the probability that God is speaking to America through these and other verses in the Word of God. And America is hell-bent to do it her way. There's a price to pay for that. And the sad part is, most people would disagree with a good portion of what I've just told you. And here's why. We are independent-minded people that have been taught that God is so good, He would never correct us. God is not a destroyer of nations. <laughs> you need to go check with Israel and see what happened there. And see that until 1948, there was no Israel for years and years and years. There is an Israel now, a nation of Israel. There will be a restoration of Israel. And God will bring her back. But now she's still not repented. She's still not brought herself to the point of being what God wants. But she will, according to the word of God. I wonder if God's going to extend that much mercy and grace to America before he has to take her off the map. You do know. That there's no solid evidence that this great country as it was and as it is in some extent now is as, as important as it's been in history is not even whispered about in the end times. It's not in there, folks. No matter how, how you try to take the eagle and the, and the owls and all those things, it's not America. She's not there. So what, what do we do? I'm not, this is not a message of doom. It's a message to, to repent while there's time. It has to be individually, and it'll have to be nationally. But it won't start till the church starts the ball rolling. It's always been that way. So, the harbinger is a warning and also a promise. God promised Israel if she would repent, that he would restore her. I've often said that there's no doubt, and I preached the message here, that I believe God is absolutely, that America is under the judgment hand of God tonight, as I stand here, has been for several years. Because of things that I just listed and many other. Simply because of rebelling against God. But there's hope. As long as there's life, there's hope. As long as there's life, there's, an, there's a way to get back to where we need to be. I don't want to offer any false illusions that I believe that, that America as a country will ever repent before God, but America's church better. We need the presence and the power of God to survive whatever's coming. So, stay with me through this, and let's glean what we can from what this, this man has written, and what others have said, and what we've studied over the years and ask God to help us gather this together so that we can get a clear picture of, of what God has done, what He is doing, and basically, God has been so good, He even lets us know before it happens. And we can choose to ignore it, or we can choose to accept it and do what God says. Isn't that a loving God to me? He didn't have to do that, but He does. So, I've given you a snapshot of the beginning of the harbinger. Let me read something that I, I, I said in here, I saw in here, and I want to read it. It was a, in the narrative, uh, the person was asked, 
What is the 9-10 effect? Isaiah 9-10 that I just read to you. Let me read it again just in case you've forgotten since we passed it over. And here's what it says in Isaiah 9-10. The bricks are fallen, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down. By the way, this tree at the building in 9-11 that fell was a sycamore. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. This man was asked, what is the Isaiah? Which is that? Which is what? This is what it is, he says. It's the attempt of a nation to defy the course of its judgment apart from repentance. Will instead set in motion a chain of events to bring about the very calamity it sought to avert. Let me read that again. What is the Isaiah 9-10 effect? The attempt of a nation, we will, we will, we will. In fact, he says in verse 9 that Ephraim re replied in pride and stoutness of heart. That was the reply. The attempt of a nation to defy the course of its judgment apart from repentance will instead set in motion a chain of events to bring about the very calamity it sought to avert. America's attempt to stop terrorism, supposedly, that we'll rebuild, we'll show them we'll build a bigger building, we'll build a taller building. But I need to tell you, no matter what kind of building you build, unless you're found, your life is built on the foundation of repentance to God, it'll just be destroyed. As certainly as a country or a nation will. Something to think about, something to mull over, something to get into your mind and start hopefully uh, we'll have the books um, I'll have another introduction for you Wednesday night and then we'll get into the book the following Sunday the Lord willing but I think we need to set aside set aside some understanding are you are, are you getting the overall thrust of what the book is about are you Understanding that we're not attempting to say that God was speaking directly to America in Isaiah 9 10. You understand that. You understand that the only thing we're doing is using this as a parable that could very well, and we'll show, the, and the author shows, it's all, you don't have to be, you'd have to really pull hard to deny that it has some application to America right now. So think about it. Anybody have any questions? Sobering, isn't it? When you think about it, and it should be, and I don't mean it's something that, to make us fear. Is there's no reason to fear? Uh, the, re, the the fear is when we refuse to repent. Then you need to fear, because God will judge people or nations that choose to repent. And uh, Mike. Absolutely. Civil disobedience should always be exercised when it's against the Word of God. I totally agree. And I'm thankful for those, those clerk of the courts who says, we refuse, we will not issue license. And of course, you know what will happen, just like what, what's happening right now. Even bakeries are being sued who refuse to bake wedding cakes for our same-sex marriage, right? Well, they'll do that just, all they can do is levy fines or, or levy some kind of punishment. That's exactly, I agree. Here's the problem. Um, the government has no backbone because the people have allowed the government to run the people instead of the people running the government. We're supposed to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. But now we're under a dictatorship, ladies and gentlemen. Our government, and by the way, any time that a people... That a people fear their government, that's tyranny. And that's where we are. You say IRS and every person goes there. And by the way, you probably have a right to with all the things that are going on. I, I, listen to me, and I hope I'm not misunderstood. I love our country. I don't love what it's become. And I believe that the problem, Mike, you hit on something that we'll be talking about unless people stand up. That's why... I said this morning in here, 
I refuse to do marriage counseling for single same-sex marriage. I refuse based on the ground that the Word of God teaches me against it. I refuse to perform public ceremonies that are involved same-sex. Not because of the people I have. I love the people. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact I'm not going to negate what the Word of God says just because the government says I have to. So whatever. So what I've decided to do after calling our attorney, we have David Gibbs III, who is our church attorney that keeps us up on legal matters. He suggests basically that I do what I did this morning. That I say that I'm no longer going to be doing marriage counseling. I will be doing counseling. I put a period there. I will be performing marriage, but only private marriages. By invitation only. You understand what I just said? I'll still do the work of a pastor. I refuse to quit that, no matter what they say. So, uh, how, many, how many years ago, we used to, you always kind of laugh about it when I tell you, if, if we stay with this book, if I as a pastor stay with this book, I'm going to jail and I know it. And some of you say, well, we'll go with you. I don't want you to go with me. I want you to pray that we can get right with God. Amen? Of course, we could pray in there. But see, I ha I've already been there before, so I'm no stranger to jail. But this time, I want to go for the right reason, if I go. And I don't want that to sound macho or, or stupid or anything. I, I'm not looking to, I'm not trying to break into jail. You know that. Pam? Uh, Sunday night and Wednesday night. For, I'm not quite sure what we'll be doing on Sunday night. If we, if we make the other change, then we'll be just be doing it on Wednesday night. I'm not quite sure what we'll do on that. But we are going to be going through, not just through the book, but through the principles of the book would be a better statement. And it, will, it won't take me, I won't, I won't, won't, it won't take me as long to go through it as it will for you to read it. But as far as sessions, but I, I would encourage you if you choose to, if you choose to, if you want to read it, you can buy it, James. Oh, okay. You were just playing with that. You were doing your job, and I thought you had your hand up. Okay, Joy. Oh, it doesn't say anywhere that there, America's involved at all in, 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 in end-time prophecy. America isn't listed like other nations are. Israel's mentioned um, Russia's mentioned, Germany's, Europe, most of Europe's mentioned, mentioned in the Bible, but America's nowhere in there. So if America existed as the nation that we are during the end time prophecy, certainly we'd be listed in Scripture. I'm sorry? Um, I think the inference is there. I don't know that China is mentioned by name itself. Read Isaiah 38, 39. And you get most some of the nations. By the way, some of the nations' names have changed, but you can you can trace their names out. Okay, we've uh, got started. Let's see where we go with this. And thirty-eight, thirty-nine, yes, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, and thirty-nine. By the way, you won't have any more trouble with pre-tribulation rapture if you read that, and you won't have any trouble with um, mid-tribulation rapture either. Because they're going to be seven years of burning the weapons. They're not going to burn it in the millennial kingdom, I can guess you, bet you. Okay. Anybody have any questions? You've been great listeners. Did I give you something to think about? Okay. Well, let's just think about it and see what happens. I promise you this. I will absolutely stay within the perimeters of this book. I won't go outside that. If I do, it'll be conjecture or a lot of other things. And we'll make sure you know before I say it. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask God's blessings. And Brother Bob Hoyle, how about praying our closing prayer for us, please?